Yo, 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 what is up? Welcome back to a, another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftandbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic manner. Today, we are taking a trip through evolutionary history to explore how three survival traits for us humans may hold some secrets to present day longevity. And of course, how we can start tapping into them. Give it a little tap. This is a theory known as the metabolic winter hypothesis. And it's built around the idea that once common hardships that we humans had to face during the winter months can upregulate specific cellular and metabolic pathways that protect and preserve our critical biological systems. And you may be thinking, from what? Quite frankly, ourselves. Our disease promoting habits, our dis functional societal norms, our somewhat successful symptom management system, and our essentially non-existent disease prevention system. That kind of stuff. The good news is we like to rebel against societal health norms up in here. Right, production team? No, don't don't rebel against me. We're, we're a team. So in the next 12 minutes and four seconds, we'll be breaking down what the metabolic hypothesis is. It's three components and how you can start deploying them into your sustainable health strategy. And production team, you know, before, before we go any further, you can take off the gloves, the scarves, the hat, the winter war gear. Um, I love the dedication, but it's the middle of August. First, let's start with a little history. The thing is, food was not always as abundant as it is today. For the majority of human history, food security especially in those winter months, was no guarantee and really relied on proper planning and a little bit of luck to get through these scarce and potentially deadly times. Fast forward to modern day, advances in agriculture, food manufacturing and processing have actually flipped the script, making calorie scarcity actually less prevalent than calorie excess. And here's a not so fun fact. Individuals who are overweight worldwide outnumber individuals who are malnourished. Yet, information regarding nutrition has never been more out there and accessible. With books, blogs, podcasts, and crazy dudes on YouTube widely available, this rise of highly processed, highly refined, affordable foods in combination with big profit-driven business, you must be the monopoly guy, and savvy marketing has changed our relationship with food from one of fuel to one of palatability. And this is an all year round thing. Gone are the times of food scarcity by season, AKA those colder months. Now, I think we'll all agree that it's a good thing that the greater population is not dealing with starvation, but we must beg the questions. First, is this self-created environment of ubiquitous, cheap, tasty calories consumed during all waking hours causing any harm? Second, is our macronutrient-based organization of food and modern marketing legitimizing certain processed foods as equivalent to their real whole food counterparts with little to no objection from overseeing bodies? And are these present-day societal norms driving overnutrition and metabolic dysfunction rather than health and longevity? And finally, probably the most important question of them all, what's all this got to do with a metabolic winter? Right. I know, that, that was probably the one that you were really thinking. Well, when in Rome. Yes. <laughs> Please go on. Do as the Romans do. The hypothesis. The metabolic winter hypothesis suggests that there is a relationship among calorie scarcity, mild cold stress, and sleep that may explain the increase in prevalence of nutritionally related disease. These are all commonalities that we humans likely faced during the winter months. Limited food supply with longer fasting windows, cold weather, with an increasing need of internal heat production, and prolonged nights of rest, aka sleep, to preserve energy. This theory argues that during these tough times, our bodies, the survival machines that they are, upregulate specific survival pathways that preserve the cellularly strong and sacrifice the weak, putting our bodies in the very best position to make it to April showers and Mayflowers. I mean, who doesn't like Mayflowers? This theory suggests that we not venture back into these times, literally, but try and simulate it 
from within by incorporating certain health interventions into our everyday life that can trigger our cells to start having a longevity infused snowball fight in the middle of August. So what are some ways we can do just that? First, a strategic fasting protocol. It is no secret that we love strategic fasting for longevity around here. Look no further than the 50 plus videos on our Fasting 101 playlist for the reasons why. But at a high level, this is how it pertains to this theory. Calorie restriction has shown to upregulate longevity pathways in humans. This is essentially going long periods of time restricting caloric intake. Hmm, I guess you could say like, kind of like a long winter. Animal models have taken this a step further, showing caloric restriction as an effective way to delay the diseases of aging and even extend lifespan. And it does this by upregulating a network of genes that evolve to protect organisms during times of food scarcity. Maybe like, you know, when it's cold outside. This longevity survival network includes modulating nutrient sensing pathways such as mTOR, AMPK, IGF-1, and the seven sirtuins, which are a family of defense enzymes that we cover in depth here. Research has associated many of these longevity pathways as major players in improving and preventing the modern conditions that make up metabolic syndrome, such as obesity, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. And we take a deep dive into many of these pathways in a bunch of other videos, which I will all link in the show notes below. However, on the contrary of this idea of caloric restriction is the other side of the spectrum, where most of us in the modern world typically sit. Chronic overnutrition, which I'd say is one of the nicest ways to describe our modern day habits, has been linked to mitochondrial stress, degraded cellular health, and overall disease. With excess fructose, branch chain amino acids, trans fat, and alcohol being shown to impair things such as mitochondrial function and drive the accumulation of fat in and around the liver, which, if you're keeping score at home, ain't cool for biological business. But as anyone who's ever tried a diet knows, eating less is no fun, and it's straight up hard this modern day. So what if there was a way to get the benefits of caloric restriction without the, you know, restriction part. Enter intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding. This is essentially a daily or weekly strategy that structures strategic feeding fasting windows for an individual which don't limit energy consumption or food. Only the time periods in which the energy is consumed. And both animal and human research suggests that Intermittent fasting or time-restricted feeding can actually mimic many of the benefits of calorie restriction without that calorie restriction part. Damn. Okay. I, I, I see you vibe in production team. And like I said before, we have a ton of videos on this channel breaking down the cool and emerging science, which I will link all below. But if you're just first exploring this concept, this is a good place to start. But as it pertains to this little powwow, a daily, weekly, or monthly fasting strategy may be one of the best ways to tap into some of these ancient longevity pathways that we all possess, simulating one of the staples of winter in a very sustainable way. But what about the, you know, real staple of winter? The cold part. Winter is coming. Who would have thunk that getting a little cold is linked to a bunch of really cool health benefits at the cellular and metabolic level. And beyond! No, Buzz, Buzz Lightyear. There seems to be no sign of intelligent life anywhere. Okay, we'll keep going. It's been associated with the upregulation of AMPK and sirtuin longevity pathways, similar to fasting, which protect DNA, mediate mitochondrial function and biogenesis, and stimulate things such as our in-house cellular recycling program, autophagy. It's been shown to reduce inflammation and triggers the release of in-house pain-relieving opioids and cannabinoids, which help regulate mood and anxiety. Also being able to increase levels of those two cool for school neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine, further enhancing the overall feeling of well-being. Oh yeah, it also upregulates fat burn. How you ask? by turning on a process called non-shivering thermogenesis, where the body essentially converts white adipose tissue or WAC tissue to bat 
adipose tissue or more metabolically active brown or beige adipose tissue, increasing the mitochondrial density of the tissue and thus the fat burning for heat output. All this by getting a little cold. Now, this doesn't mean you have to turn off your heat for the winter and go move to Canada, although I hear it's quite beautiful. It just means that it may be worth exploring adding a few habits to your daily or weekly routine, like a cold shower, at least two minutes long, a few times a week, a 15 to 20 minute soak in an ice bath or cold body of water once a week. Or if you have the budget, even a little cryotherapy action. These are all very cool scenarios. Get it? <laughs> no, okay, I'll keep going. Where acute stressors can end up combating and mitigating chronic stress, which we cover more on here. But what about that last piece to the winter puzzle? That extra rest piece. Don't sleep on sleep. As you guys probably know by now, as much as we love strategic fasting, we may love good sleep quality even more and thus have the fully equipped how to sleep playlist to talk about it. Let's continue the common theme here and start with a not so fun fact. I don't know why we're doing not so fun facts today, but it seems to be a common theme. So let's keep it going. We Society are chronically sleep deprived and too little sleep is associated with conditions such as obesity and cardiometabolic diseases. It's also been linked to impaired glucose tolerance, insulin resistance, increased appetite, reduced energy expenditure and cognitive impairment. Hmm. So maybe it's kind of important. No? Add in the overabundance of artificial light at night, the nonstop connectivity to the outside world, and the modern I'll sleep when I'm dead mentality. And we humans have created an internal scenario of chronic stress and inflammation, a situation that nurtures disease and dysfunction. Now, this theory argues that we've evolved sleeping in cool, dark environments, pretty much the opposite to the modern day warm and cozy conditions. And deviating from this evolutionary norm has impacted and impaired our sleep quality and thus, our short-term health and our long-term longevity. And since we know sleep is the foundation of all things health, that right there ain't a good thing. Now, why is a cool and dark environment important? Well, you may not have known this, but a decline in core body temperature is associated with both sleep onset and sleep quality. Yet, very few of us now sleep in the cold. And interestingly enough, there have been studies that have shown an association between weight gain and bedroom temperature. So building a sleep hygiene routine that taps into these deep evolutionary ties of a cool, dark environment can be pretty critical for optimizing this thing we spend one third of our life doing. And if you're looking for a place to get started with sleep hygiene, I highly suggest you check out this video here. So let's bring this full circle. When you think about it, our 7 million year evolutionary path was dominated by two seasonal challenges, calorie scarcity and mild cold stress. And in the last few centimeters of our evolutionary mile, we solved them both. This hypothesis challenges that these two once common conditions may be key in the fight against 21st century disease. Is it bulletproof? Absolutely not. But it does display that we have a pretty obvious disconnect between our biology that has evolved to counter seasonal calorie scarcity and mild cold stress and our modern world of ubiquitous calories and excess warmth. A world in which we succeeded in combating malnutrition to the point where we are now faced with the reality of chronic overnutrition with the best advice to prevent the associated diseases being eat less, move more. I think we can and probably should do better. And that's why right here on this very channel, we take back ownership of what is rightfully ours. Interestingly, obesity and chronic disease are most often seen in people and animals who are chronically warm and overnourished. Could it be that our problem is in this modern world, winter never truly comes? No, it's, it's still August. It's just, a, it's just an effect. So if you've got longevity in mind, which if you've made it this far, I know you do, this may be a theory to noodle on a little bit. Maybe while taking a swim in some frigid water after eight hours of solid Z's and 
16 hours of fasting. Just saying. Hell, someday you may be able to make it to production teams level who have a metabolic winter game so strong they need full-fledged snow gear in the middle of August. Seriously though, guys, you, could, you should probably take that off. You know, it's probably not gonna end well. It's like 90 degrees. Yeah.